You probably all know the famous quote, computers help me solve the problems I've never had uh, without them. And once again, this has become true during the last years um, because voting seemed to be so easy, especially for us. Uh, and then the computers came in, and the, the NEDAP chess computer showed us um, <laughs> that, <it's laughs> that it, 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 it looks fairly easy, but it obviously isn't. And there are lots of problems behind that. And Ulrich Wiesner will talk today about solutions. And as far as I read about the problems that comes uh, with these solutions, and if that um, irritates you or confuses you at the moment. I hope he'll clarify things up for us. Thanks again with a warm welcome for Ulrich. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this talk is about um, attempts to um, implement secure and auditable, auditable and transparent e-voting systems using cryptography. Um, so that's next generation e-voting after NEDAP and Digital Pen, probably. And um, this talk is going to be from a voter's perspective. Um, I'm, not a cryptog I'm not an expert in cryptography. And if you are, so please be patient with me. Um, this talk is going to be structured like I'm, I'm going to repeat a little bit um, why is e-voting an issue. Um, why is it so difficult to implement an e-voting system uh, that is acceptable for democratic elections? Um, and what issues do we introduce if we just keep physical copies of the ballots, like introducing a paper trail? Um, now, recently, there has been, have been a number of cryptographic solutions suggested, like um, three ballots, punch scan, bingo voting, and others. And I'm going to... Um, on a high level, uh, touch upon each of those and, and explain what they do and what the concepts, uh, underlying concepts are. And I'm um, going to discuss um, w whether I think that fixes the issues from a voter's perspective. What's the motivation for that talk? Um, there seems to be a strong community believing that the evish voting issues that we've seen in the past like with the NEDAP chess computers, um, are just because the previous approaches haven't been implemented properly and, and that the issues are fixable if we just do it properly. Um, in Germany also, there has been an um, IT security award this year for a concept called bingo voting, which created quite some media attention. Um, and uh, there's, there just seem to be a number of people who think um, it's now fixed, um, let's implement bingo voting and we are done. Um, but I believe it's not that easy. Um, before I start, I'd like to say uh, thank you. I've been here two years ago um, to talk about the um, case I filed or wanted to file with the Constitutional Court here in Germany. And um, to do that, I needed 100 signatures from voters. And um, just here after this session, I, I got something like 80 signatures, but some of you didn't stop collecting. And um, I got mails with uh, hundreds of signatures, and in the end we had something like 850 signatures. So thank you very much for this. <clears throat> now, why do we have to deal with e-voting at all? Um, what's the relevance of this topic? Um, Voting computers have been used in polling stations in a number of European countries. In the Netherlands, um, there was an almost 100% coverage. Um, and um, that has been discontinued, thanks to Rob. Um, um, Ireland bought um, NEDAP devices for 100% of the polling stations, but decided to never use them. Um, um, Belgium, I believe, has 40, had 40% 40 coverage, and I think it has been discontinued because the, the license to use it ran out, 
um, but, but I'm not entirely sure um, wh where this is going. Um, France has a 5% coverage um, growing. Germany has a 5% coverage. Um, it's, it's with the Federal Constitutional Court now. Uh, we had a hearing in October and we're ex expecting a decision from the court whether the authorities are going to be allowed to use that in, in future during the next um, weeks, not weeks. Um, voting via the internet is a topic in other countries. Um, in Estonia since 2006, and they're now even looking uh, to, to vote via mobile phone. Um, in Switzerland, some cantons have used internet voting, and there are discussions and trials in various countries, including the United Kingdom, Austria, Norway, Russia. And now sometimes people say, no, we're discontinuing that, like we had that, such statements in the UK and in Austria. Um, but um, it's, I, I don't think it's completely off the table as long as th there's still um, a sufficient community promoting it. Um, why is e-voting an issue at all? Um, well, the democratic election principles are that um, an election should be verifiable, transparent, secret, and th that's all co procedural um, principles that ensure that elections are free, fair, and general. So the values that should be protected are free, fair, and general, and how we achieve that by making them verifiable, transparent, and secret. Um, now, what is this about? Secret, the, the secrecy of the vote um, basically ensures the free election. It um, allows you to, um, to choose what, you, what your preference is without, any, without experiencing any negative personal consequences, and you can't sell your vote. Um, the auditability is a measure of quality assurance. It, it should ensure um, that the election result is fair and honest. Um, it's the audits, audits are typically conducted by the authority, authorities, like recounts, um, and therefore it can never replace transparency because um, you can't just say, hey, let me audit the votes, that, that's nothing that um, somebody will allow to, to you as a voter. <clears throat> and transparency is really the, the value that's, that's open to, um, to, to voters. It ensures that the election is, con uh, is conducted according to the regulation and principles and that everybody can verify that. Um, it creates trust, um, it creates trust in the results and hence um, ensures um, that people believe in the legitimacy of the elected body. Um, it prevents denunciation of the results so nobody can come and say um, yeah but I don't believe this result is correct um, because then it, you would have to have tampering in front of the, um, of the public. Um, and transparency can never be delegated to the authorities because it's taking away this, this right of everybody to, um, to understand that the, um, the election is free and fair. Um, if you think, I've never seen that transparency and I've never attended an a, a poll in an election office and I've never been participating in an, an account. Well, um, all the OSCE member states have committed to transparent elections in the Copenhagen Declaration 1990. And there's different ways that has been implemented in different countries. For example, in Germany, anybody uh, can observe elections and counting. Um, so you don't even have to be a citizen, you don't have to be um, older than 18, you, have to, you don't have to be registered with any authorities, you don't have to bring your passport, it's just open to everybody and it's just restricted by means of safety and public order in the polling places. Um, in Austria, for example, um, it's not a right for everybody to participate, but, um, there's, but the, the um, p parties con uh, participating in the election can um, nominate election witnesses, which then go to the um, polling station and um, witness the election on behalf of the parties. And similar concepts are implemented in the UK, for example. The, the parties, the participating parties can nominate election witnesses and um, organizations or individuals can register for observation. 
Now, what is the issue with e-voting? Um, in a paper-based election, you basically have a white box. The, the ballot box is a passive device. Um, it doesn't do anything to the, to the um, votes you put in. Um, it, it doesn't do any processing, so the input will be the output. Um, and, and if you then witness the counting of the um, votes, um, and if you can witness that, the, that nobody tampers with the ballot box during the election process, um, then you can assume that, that the result um, will, will, de will um, be just dependent on the input and on nothing else. Now, when, when you go, when you switch to e-voting and you have a black box device from a voter's perspective, um, which um, collects the votes and stores the votes and counts them afterwards, um, the thing is you have a secret input because the secrecy of the, um, of, of the votes. You have a secret input and you have a secret processing and there's no way you can audit the result. Um, so, and and that's, that's a fundamental difference from other um, applications, IT applications you might want to trust like a cash machine. Um, and with a cash machine you can also, you can always see what the input is, the, uh, the amount you want to withdraw what the transactions on your account are, um, and you don't need to know how the cash machine works to check the result. And that's different with, with elections because the input, the votes are secret. So um, the processing is not available, the input is not available, how can I check the output? And um, it's, it's obvious that if you want to check the output, you have to have a little look at the input. And um, you have to lift the secrecy by a, by a trusted entity who looks at the input and then ensures um, that um, the input and the output um, are related properly. Um, why do people want to use e-voting? There's a number of inappropriate reasons which are nevertheless repeated by authorities again and again. Uh, one is um, because they say it's cheaper. That's a questionable statement. Um, but even if it was, um, that wouldn't be a reason to, to, to tamper with, with the transparency of an election. Um, they also say because we've already spent the money on the um, equipment, that was actually one argument that they, that they even presented in front of the Constitutional Court. Um, um, or because it saves in one hour of counting. Um, there's some better reasons. Um, um, which are at least worth discussing. Um, you could implement more complex voting systems um, like cumulative voting where you have multiple votes per voter um, and in Germany for example um, we have um, elections in, in some areas in southern Germany where people have 50 votes and more. Basically one vote per member in the city uh, council you elect. Um, Hamburg and Brandenburg, for example, have um, three to five votes per voter, um, but you can still distribute on, many, on multiple candidates or you can accumulate on one candidate. Um, in other countries, there are um, prefer pref preferential election systems like single transferable vote or systems where you basically state if candidate A is not successful, then my preference is candidate B. Um, now, um, all these um, voting systems have the feature that counting is then very high effort um, and it probably, it's probably then prohibitive to use um, manual counting in these situations. So you have a trade-off between um, the transparency issues and, and the um, benefits of these voting systems. Now my, my personal preference here clearly is um, on preference because what helps, a, um, what, what does a um, complex, vote, sophisticated voting system help if you can't check that the results are correct? Um, but at least that's something um, that, that drives um, the introduction of e-voting. Um, actually, specifically these, the, the, in Germany the communities in these um, noted um, areas are um, desperate for um, or some of them are desperate for, for e-voting 
because they feel they have, well, that, that, that's really where the good business case is, yeah? If, if you have a lot to count, um, then automation certainly um, helps. Yeah, and um, we will see what that does to some concepts um, later. Um, well, the easiest fix to the issues of e-voting suggested is, uh, why don't we just keep physical copies? Like, why don't we um, just scan the ballots, or why, we, why don't we just um, have a paper trail uh, coming out of the e-voting machine, and then we can recount? Um, so paper trail and also the digi digital pen that was attempted to be introduced in Hamburg um, follow that concept. And that obviously allows an independent uh, validation of the result. And uh, you can manually count the receipts if you want. Um, but there's a number of issues coming with that. What, for example, what uh, triggers the recount? Um, which polling stations get audited? Who decides that? Who makes that decision? Um, when and where is the count conducted, and um, who has control over the physical copies um, until the recount. And, um, well, it, it can probably fix the, trans the, the, the auditability issue, but it will um, not fix the transparency issue, um, because if you want to implement the transparency piece, um, you would need to recount in the polling station immediately after the election, nobody would be allowed to take the um, ballots away and, um, and, and count later on demand. And that, be that basically kills the business case of e-voting, because if you have to count anyway, then why, why won't you use e-voting in the first place? Um, well, and um, if you just restrict your recount to a, um, to a sample of the, the ballot of the polling places, um, then you can probably maintain your business case, but then you introduce other issues. For example, in Hamburg, um, the authorities suggested that the recount should be um, a fixed percentage of 1.5% of the polling stations. And um, that should act as a proof of the correctness of the um, election devices, of the digital pens, for once and forever. Um, but but um, there's obviously a number of issues coming with that. The sample would need to be truly random. Um, to prevent fraud in the polling stations where you don't audit. And the sample size would need to depend on the outcome because the closer um, the election result is, the, more, um, the less votes you need to flip and the more you need to audit to actually find any tempering. So um, which sample size ensures a high probability that you can detect fraud? That's an easy problem for a race with just two candidates like in US president election. You just look at the number of votes you need to flip to change the results, and you can then make an estimate um, how, how, how big your sample needs to be and, and how, what the probability is to actually um, detect uh, um, uh, any tampering with that approach. Um, now, it's more difficult than a multi-party, multi-coalition scenario. For example, in Germany, we have a 5% tre uh, threshold um, for a party to be elected. Um, and in Hesse in um, 2008, um, the party, the Linke, just passed this threshold by 3,600 3, votes. That's about one vote per polling station. And that's actually not very much and difficult to detect. And then um, if you, when you normally would need um, 25,000 votes to flip a seat, in this scenario, um, there were 53 seats for the two conservative parties, CDU and FDP, and there were 57 seats for the, um, for the other parties, which are more left-wing. And um, so you would, you would need to, to switch th three seats to ch change the outcome of the election. Um, but actually, if you just... Um, flip these 3,600 votes for, for Linke, uh, then they would not make it into the parliament and their seats would be redistributed to the other parties. And then the um, CDU FDP would have won the election with just one vote per polling station. Um, yeah, there's other issues with keeping physical copies. What do you do if the 
electronic results and the audit don't match, which result is used. City of Hamburg suggested that the electronic results should be binding rather than the hand count. Um, so why do you then audit in the first place? Um, and, and what do you do if you find a mismatch? Do you have to increase your sample size? It's all things that, that people have not spent much time on. Um, um, also, if you create your physical copies with a printer, you uh, introduce a tempest problem um, and it's, it gets very difficult to protect the secrecy of the vote. Um, also, p companies like NEDAP said they would never introduce a paper trail because um, the printers fail and um, create paper jam. Well, that's probably not our issue, but, but the vendors. Um, but um, that's one that uh, was, was uh, created or mentioned. Now, um, would it not be much more elegant to um, introduce transparencies through um, cryptographic methods? And um, the idea basically is um, we use cryptography, cryptography to ensure that the uh, election is, uh, to, to ensure the election integrity, and we provide the voter with an encrypted receipt, um, so the voter can check that the vote is cast as intended and counted as cast, but he still cannot um, prove to other people how he was, uh, how he, how he voted. So he can't sell his vote, and he can't be. Um, um, su um, subject to coercion, which is nötigung. Um, there have been a number of proposals over the last couple of years, so um, bingo voting is not the first one. Uh, Preta voté, uh, three ballots, scratch and vote, punch scan, scan integrity, bingo voting, and vote box uh, are some of them. Um, the, there's detailed information on each of them in the internet, so um, just, just have a look on the internet on, on more details on this. I'm, I'm going to touch on some of them, um, on three ballots, on punch scan, and on bingo voting. Um, they have, um, all proposals have one in common, um, that the ballots receive a unique ID, so that's really a, a big difference to a normal paper election. You have individualized um, pa paper ballots or individualized ballots. Um, and these, this ID could be random or it could be a serial number. And um, the voter receives a receipt which contains his vote in an encrypted form and the serial ID. Um, all encrypted votes are published and the voter can verify that his vote is on the list and is on the, vis on, is on the list in the same way um, as he casted it. Um, there are some immediate issues um, that arise from this approach without even looking at the details of these concepts. Um, can a verification that my vote is counted as cast replace a verification of the entire election? Um, um, probably cannot because it doesn't protect against ballot stuffing. So uh, if, if you can't observe where the votes come from, then people must, m might just inject additional um, votes. Um, it does not allow external observers. The only observing persons are the voters. Um, and it also creates the issue um, how many voters need to cooperate to actually unveil fraud um, and can the cooperation be sabotaged for example um, if I know somebody can, will not check can I flip his vote for example if I put a waste bin next to the polling place um, and people who don't want to check, just throw the receipt in there. Can I collect these receipts and now have an idea which votes I can flip? Or can I, can I make up a, um, an organization which pretends to check the vote on your behalf and then collect receipts and uh, tamper with the votes which are related to these receipts? There's other immediate issues like um, who protects the encryption from being decrypted. So is my vote really secret and for how long? Um, who controls and protects the encryption key keys? Um, is the serial random number of my, on my ballot box really, or on, my, on my receipt really um, random or does it contain any information on the voter's identity or on the vote casted? Um, and coercion might not require that the, the secret is really broken. Um, any doubt in the secrecy might, be, might enable you to 
force somebody to um, elect in a specific way. Um, who ensures that the receipt is just issued to a single voter and that people who um, receive, uh, who have voted the same way, don't receive um, the same receipt. And then you free up serial IDs, which you can then um, use to vote somebody different, for, vote for, some, for somebody different. So that's, that's all general issues which are common to all the concepts and um, which need to be answered by each of these um, approaches. Um, the first one is really a, for warm-up. Um, it's probably not even, or Ronald Rivest um, does, doesn't even pretend it's cryptography, but it, um, it, it has many of the concepts already in there that are used by the other approaches. Um, the, the paper ballot has three columns, or ballots, and um, the idea is that you um, mark every row for every candidate, you make one, um, you, you mark once, and the candidates you choose, you mark twice. So, first step is you, you mark every row randomly, um, and then your candidates you mark twice. And then uh, there's a trusted checker machine um, which ensures that the vote is valid. So you put that vote into that machine and um, it, it validates the vote so that you only cast it um, as many votes as you, as you should and that you have a um, mark, a tick in every row. And then you decide on um, one of the three columns or ballots which you want to keep and you get a copy of that. And you can take the copy home and um, you separate the three other ballots and you put them into a ballot box. And the votes are counted as usual and then obviously you get um, three N votes for N voters um, just by the random pattern you, you start with and then um, you have additional votes um, which, which, um, which are um, due to your selection. Um, all the ballots get published on a bulletin board and then you use your receipt and you compare it with what's on the, on the bulletin board and then um, you can verify that at least a third of your vote is, um, is, is counted as, um, as you cast it. Is. And the other two, um, you assume that whoever organized the election doesn't know about which of the three ballots you took and um, so they wouldn't be able which one to tamper. But it's, um, um, if, if, if the voting organization of this checker machine doesn't know which of the three receipts you've chosen, you've chosen then um, you have a good chance to detect any tampering. Now, um, Rivas says it's not a cryptographic voting protocol, but however, it basically uses a kind of voter-generated random key um, the pattern you start with um, can be implemented for paper-based and electronic elections. Um, it's, it's really intended, I think, as an academic discussion paper rather than a serious proposal for use in elections. Um, it's not coercion-free. You can sell your vote or you can be forced um, to sell your vote, uh, forced to vote in a specific way because um, you have, the vote has control over the pattern he makes and um, he can, um, in, a, in a typical Bundestag election, for example, with 10 candidates and 10 parties, you have 20 rows, and um, you have so many possibilities to make a random pattern that, that, that you can tell somebody, I, I'm going to mark my ballot paper like this. And in a polling station with about 1,000 voters, it's extremely unlikely that then somebody else will have any of the three requested ballots um, the same just by accident. Um, there's more issues. It requires trust in the serial numbers being secret and truly random. <coughs> so it puts the secrecy of the election at risk. It requires trust in the, in the checker and carbon copy mechanism. Because if you, if you know which received is chosen, which of the three, 
then um, you can tamper with the two other ballots and change the um, ballot as such. Um, it's also an extremely user-unfriendly approach um, um, to, if, if you get to more complex um, elections and if, if you force people to mark every row uh, to start with, I, I think that's nothing that um, really will be appealing to voters. Um, it might enhance auditability. Um, so if, if you are the voting authority and if nobody complains, you have a good chance um, that everything, everything went well and you had no errors in your process, but it doesn't enhance transparency because it requires trust in the checker mechanism rather than in the counting. Um, and um, the integrity of the, two, of the two ballots that you don't copy is at risk. And why don't you trust the counting in the first place? Um, before I move on to the two other approaches, I am going to introduce some fundamental concepts, um, which many, many of you might be aware of anyway, or better than I am. Um, Mixnets is one introduced by David Shaw in the early 80s. Um, it's used for many other things than just voting for email, um, anonymization, and things like that. Um, in elections, if, if you want to use mixed nets, you basically um, you have keys which permute your initial votes. So um, if, if I have a, um, a candidate B here then, and a candidate A here, then I, I mix that in the next step with the, with the permutation key. And I can use many of the, I can have many of these keys, and I can, and these keys can be controlled by different people, and that's really the the key of it, so that that nobody um, really has the entire knowledge to understand how is this information on the left hand side be transformed in the um, information on the right hand side. So I can I can count something through a mixed net um, without. Um, without revealing the anonymity of the vote. Um, Rivas and others in 2002 have suggested to um, use these um, mixed nets in e-voting in 2002, and they've, they've introduced something that, like what they called randomized partial checking, and what you do is you look at, a, look at a pair of keys or pair of servers or whatever you want to call it. And if you, if you go to the middle column here, to the information in the middle column, um, f you, you throw a dice for each of these bits or information pieces. And um, you either then check and um, open the left-hand side of the connection or the right-hand side. So, um, if, if there's some, and then you compare the, the values on, on both sides, and if, if you have the same in both boxes, then um, nobody tampered with. And um, so you, if, if somebody changes something, you have a 50% chance to detect it, because you either have to, to, to change it here, or you have to change it here to, to, to tamper with the outcome. So um, for every vote flip, you have a 50% chance to find that in the audit. Um, so to get away with um, n flip votes, you um, have a prob probability of two to the minus nth, um, and that's quite that, with, with a relatively low um, n. This is already a relatively low chance. Um, so it maintains the the secret of the uh, of the vote despite of the of an audit. Um, another concept is. Um, commit our commitments, and there's some math below it, and, and I'm, I don't want to go into too much detail, but um, um, there's, the math you use is basically that um, this formula, um, gate, uh, g to, to the uh, ith modulo p with any integer e, i, and uh, with um, a prime p, um, creates a um, permutation of, of your value. So if, if I is between, if, if G is 3 and P is 7, and I is between 0 and 5, then uh, the values for 3 to the ith, to the ith is, is this, and, oh, oops. And if you, if you do the modulo 7, then you basically get a permutation 
of your initial numbers. Um, so it creates a pseudo-random pseudo permutation of your initial sequence. And for large primes, um, it's very difficult to solve for i with a given c and a given g. Now, you can use that to commit to a secret. Um, commit in, the, in terms of that you can't change it after you've uh, revealed some information. So if you have two large primes, P and Q, and Q divides um, P minus one, and you have a private key A, and you have a public key <coughs> H, which is, which is G uh, to the eighth modulus P, <coughs> and you can commit to a secret X by choosing a random R and publish uh, a C which is calculated that, like that, and if you reveal an R and X, <coughs> it receives, um, the receiver can verify that you actually didn't, didn't change uh, your X after you committed to the secret. That's <coughs> not very intuitive, and um, I'm, um, I'm not um, ex expecting anybody here to, uh, who hasn't, hasn't dealt with that before to um, at first glance understand what this is about, but um, it, it gives you an, um, a feeling on, on what complex or how complex and how mathematical the tools are that are used um, in, in cryptography. And um, if you introduce um, crypt cryptography um, into elections, then basically if somebody wants to understand that his vote is secret and to understand um, that he can check his um, the, the, the integrity of the election, he needs to go to that math, and that's nothing um, that, that you explain your grandma uh, on, on a beer tap. Now, um, David Shorm introduced punch scan in 2006, and how does that work? Um, um, <clears throat> it basically consists of two superimposed sheets, so a blue one at the bottom and a and a white one at the top, and you have four candidates here, and each candidate has a random number next to it. Um, and these random numbers appear um, in three holes from the underneath layer. And if you, if you look carefully, this random order here is different than this random order here. So, um, and, and the, the ballot sheet has a serial number again, and when you vote, you mark your candidate, in this case candidate A, you mark it um, at the top and the bottom sheet, and um, then you separate the sheets and um, put one in the ballot box and take one home. And um, none of the two allows you to prove how you voted. So. Um, if, if you look at the top one, um, because this order here of the numbers was random, it doesn't give you any information what you voted, and same at the bottom. You voted for four, what that is, you don't know with the other half of the sheet. Um, and obviously you can't count that um, without knowing um, how that hangs together, um, but you can hide that information in a, in a mix net, and you can commit to through the corresponding value through um, to randomized partial checking. And, and then in the end, all receipts are published on a bulletin board, and you can go to that bulletin board after the election and check whether your vote is there as you, um, as you casted it. Now, the initial version of punch scan was not protected against coercion, and that's because if you have a two-candidate race here, um, with, with two candidates and you force somebody or you, 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 you give an award to somebody um, to, um, to either bring the top layer with, an, with a one assigned to candidate A and the left hole marked or you bring the bottom layer where the one appears, uh, where the one appears in the left and is marked, then you have th in, in three of uh, the four cases, you can, you're actually able to fulfill that requirement. Um, and in two of the cases, you've actually voted for candidate B, and only in one, you have voted for candidate A. 
So you can incentivize people to vote in a certain way. Now, if you have more than one candidate, that attack weakens, um, but it doesn't go away. Um, and it's because, well, the reason for that is um, that, the, that you first mark and then you make the choice um, whether to keep the top or the bottom letter. If you have to, commit, make, if you have to make that commitment, um, before you see the ballot sheet, that attack goes away, and that's basically then punch, can, uh, punch scan too. Um, um, but but it, 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 even though this attack is, not, um, is, is resolved, it, it, it indicates one issue that is very important with all these cryptographic methods, and that is the sequence of events um, is very important. So who commits first to, to, to the next action is essential for the, secrecy, for, for the integrity of the approach. Um, Scantegrity is a successor of punch, of punch scan of um, the same group of authors. It's a similar concept, but not on one sheet, but, but all on one sheet. There's um, random codes next to the candidate names, and then the ballot paper is scanned, and uh, the codes related to the chosen candidates are published. And there's a second version of that, where, um, where you only uncover the random codes of the chosen candidates, but not of the others. Um, and that introduces an easier complaint validation process because you, you can't, you don't know the, um, the codes of the candidates you didn't choose. Um, but what's interesting is that, this, that the same authors um, who published the first approach, punch scan, then had the, felt the need to introduce subsequent versions or subsequent approaches. So something that was meant as a, seri as a serious proposal in the first place then wasn't good enough um, later. Um, bingo voting um, is by a German team in 2007 and um, that's a um, little different approach. And you have a preparation phase where for each um, voter, you prepare a random number for every candidate, and they call that dummy votes. So basically, you have a, a, a pool of random numbers um, here for candidate A and for candidate B, and they all get um, committed to with, with a method, with, with one of these commitment methods I um, briefly talked about before, and then uh, they're shuff shuffled and published on a bulletin board. Now, in the, in the voting phase, the voter selects a candidate, in this case, candidate A, and there's a random, a trusted random number generator who, who pulls a new um, random number, and, and that's where the name bingo voting is coming from. Bingo, like they, they're suggesting a, a mechanical random device to, to make sure it's really random on trusted random. Now, in, um, when they did a... Um, a proof of concept for a University of Karlsruhe election, they, they didn't use a bingo cage, they used a, an electronic device. So um, the trust random num number generator um, creates a random number and you receive a receipt which has this trusted random number next to you, the, the candidate you chose and um, random number from the pool next to the other candidates. So you basically, um, by voting for candidate A, you are reducing the number of remaining random numbers for each candidate. And the, um, the receipt you take home, and the receipt is also published on the bulletin board, and um, you go home and you check that your, your vote has been, or that, that your receipt um, appears on the, on the bulletin board. Um, now, how do you determine the result? <clears throat> you, you just count the remaining um, dummy votes in the, in, the, in the initial pool because now you've used three votes for candidate B, C, and D. Um, they have one vote less than the others. Um, <clears throat> in the post-voting phase, you publish the results. You publish all receipts. 
You list all the unused dummy votes and corresponding commitments, and you prove that everybody, that every unopened commitment was used on um, one receipt. And you make use of randomized partial checking um, again. Um, there's a real world implementation <coughs> for the student council in Karlsruhe, um, and there's also Java code published. Um, however, that code um, doesn't compile because there's an object missing. Um, and the code comes with no documentation and doesn't use any Java docs, so it's really, um, you have to invest a lot of time to, um, to have a closer look, but um, perhaps some of you have the time or um, um, ha have, the, in, um, yeah, have fun with, with playing with this a little bit. Sorry? Sorry? Well, you make that decision. <clears throat> um, if, if the random number is not random, then votes can be stolen. Um, for example, if you have, um, if you have uh, dummy votes, um, a, a, B, C, and D, and um, the vote of one votes for candidate A, so you use your random number one, and the receipt will contain random number one, and B1 and C1 and D1, and if then the second voter votes for candidate B, the receipt will, con will contain uh, the random number two, and the dummy votes A2, C2, D2. And if then the, th the voter three votes for candidate A, um, you can represent the first random number to him again, and give him a receipt with R1, B1, C1, D1, which is the same as for the first voter, and if he looks it up, then uh, he, will be able to, um, he, he will be able to find his receipt and he won't have any concerns. Um, and you can publish a third receipt um, with, with anything you, you like and the third random number um, and the vote has flipped to C in this case um, without the voter three uh, being aware of that. Um, so you really, what you really have here is a transformation of the problem. Um, before if you don't use that, you have to trust the counting. Um, if you apply bingo voting, you have to trust the, um, the, the random nature of the random generator. Um, there's also real world hassles, like the commitments are only binding if they're really shared and if somebody looks at them. So if you publish the commitments um, for each ballot, um, for, for each polling station individually, which there are 80,000 in Germany, um, then you can um, have a look who downloads what, and um, if there's any polling places where nobody downloads everything, then you um, flip the votes in this polling place and reissue the initial commitments. Um, there's general issues which are common to all the um, approaches. Um, one is um, concept versus implementation. A secure concept doesn't ensure a secure implementation. For example, randomness, um, the random nature of a pretended random value can never be verified by an observer. You can only ensure um, that random is truly random if you know how, it, it, how the randomness is created. Um, but you can't, um, you, you, when you see random number, numbers, you can never see whether there's any inf hidden information in there. And there's, there's, there's no solution for that. Um, one example is also the uh, Debian OpenSSH implementation, um, which, is, which is a good example for, for a good concept and a poor implementation. Um, until um, May 2008, there were only th th um, 32,000 different keys created. Um, and um, so what if, and also what if you later find out that your implementation wasn't secure? Um, if you publish votes on a bulletin board, then you can't unpublish that later. So if you find out that you haven't encrypted properly due to implementation issues, you, you can't um, hide the information anymore. And there's the user versus administration issue. So um, even if the concept is secure and the code is shared, like in, in open source, um, the, the fact that the production system really runs the same code is typically not verifiable by the user. So you either need to be a, an administrator or trust um, the administrators. Um, another issue is 
Are there evil implementations of the secure concept that, from a user's perspective, um, have the same user interface? So is the, is the um, secure concept really running? Or is it something that just mocks up the user interface? And also, can I fool inexperienced users, for example, by swap swapping the sequence of user interactions, by swapping who commits first to something, um, the machine or the voter? Um, also, you introduce a denunciation attack. Um, if you are the voting authorities and you don't like the outcome of the election, you can just publish something else on the bulletin board. So you can man manipulate the bulletin board without, manipulate the, without manipulating the outcome of the election. Um, and um, the voters checking their receipts will find mismatch between the receipt on paper and published. And so you have evidence that the unwanted un outcome is a result of tampering, and you can then arrest the usual suspects. Um, that works for all protocols where the receipts are published. Um, and I don't see any way around that. Um, also, you have Alice and Bob, the, the usual candidates, um, versus reality. In, in real uh, world scenarios, you have more than candidates Alice and Bob. Um, for example, Werder is a city here 35 kilometers from Berlin with a population of 23,000 um, people. And in the city council election in 2008, um, they elected 29 city council members. Um, and there were eight parties and 109 candidates competing for these um, seats. Um, with three votes per voter and cumulative voting, so you could give all the three votes to the same candidate. And in uh, Frankfurt am Main, um, in the city council election 2006, um, there were 93 city council members and um, there were 11 parties and 643 candidates competing. And you had 93 votes per voter and uh, cumulative voting with, maximal, with a maximum of three votes per candidate. Now, this is really where the business case for e-voting is. Yeah? If you have to count uh, 93 votes per, um, um, per, per, per voter, um, then that's where you want help from, from where you would like help from, from electronic counting. Now, let's, let's have a look on, on how that works with, with the cryptographic approaches we've seen here. Um, for for Verda, um, you have these three votes and 109 candidates. So with three ballots, um, you mark 324 rows, rows once and you mark three rows twice. <laughs> for for, for Punchscan, you, you have 327 holes. Um, at the best, in, in best case, 109 groups of three, um, and they are in random order. So, <laughs> good luck with finding your candidate. Um, and with bingo voting, your receipt will contain 307, 327 random numbers, and um, you check three of the 327 random numbers for correctness. Now, go to Frankfurt. With a three ballot, you mark 1,800 rows once and 93 twice. Um, have fun with checking. Um, with punch scan, um, you have 1,929 holes, and in best case, 643 groups of three, and they are in random order. And um, you're marking, you're finding 93 um, candidates, and that becomes serious work, I think. Um, and um, with bingo voting, your receipt will contain 1,929 random numbers, of which you check 93 for correctness. Um, so um, have a nice half day in the ballot place then. Um, scrutiny, um, what happens in case of dispute? Um, who can evaluate and understand the integrity of an election? Um, probably the the, the test process is easy, but who understands what's underneath, so who understands the math, and who can evaluate or challenge the cryptographic method and ensure it ensures integrity? 
Um, this, and if, it, if something like this goes to court, this becomes a battle between experts, and it's not longer resolvable by, uh, by scrutiny committees or judges. Um, so, uh, to conclude, um, the, the core issues with, with e-voting is the combination of secret input of votes and the black box process. And with every attempt to fix this, um, and to fix the auditability or transparency issues, you have to take a little, have to, to take something away from the secrecy. And you have to look at the input, and you have to have a trusted entity um, that then ensures the, the secrecy of the vote. And um, that, that puts the secrecy of the vote at risk. So you're trading in secrecy for um, auditability and transparency. Can cryptography fix it? Um, I think it's an interesting academic problem, but um, academic world is where this topic should remain, and um, yeah, play around with it, but um, not with elections. Um, the usability of the described cryptographic methods collapses when e-voting has its biggest strengths, many votes, cumulative voting, and for simpler election systems, the added level of complexity is disproportional um, to the benefits of e-voting. So um, there we can continue to use hand counting um, and have full transparency of what's happening. And even if um, cryptography fixes the auditability, transparency remains an issue because the methods are too complex and the, the purpose of transparency is that the voter um, have no doubt about the integrity of the voting system. And this goal cannot be achieved with methods that Alice and Bob cannot understand. <laughs> and this is from yesterday's Frankfurter Allgemeine. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's on the 2009 elections in Germany. And the waiter says, um, have you already chosen? And the, this guy here says, that's not any of your business. Okay. I think I've probably... <laughs> probably used most of my time. Um, but if there's any questions or comments... I have one question. Yeah, I'm here. What's the, what is the risk? I mean, the exposure when uh, a selection, when an election is bought. I mean, what would it, would someone could gain from uh, frauding the federal elections here? What somebody gains from good buying the votes? The, the potential gain. Well, changing the outcome, I guess. What did it? <laughs> Did I, did I miss the question? Well, the question is what is the, what is the potential loss to the voters when somebody buys an election or defrauds? I mean, if you can, if you control the government here, what, would, what could you gain from it in monetary? Well, you can probably remain in business even if, um, even if you are not elected by the majority anymore. So what is, if I want a mechanical help for voting, you've said the, the example in Frankfurt, you have almost 100 votes, and it is an issue to count all them. Is there any solution, or do you say electronic voting is dead, per concept? Um, <clears throat> well, um, <laughs> predicting the future is always difficult, isn't it? So in the moment, I'd say there's no appropriate tools um, which, which ensure transparency and, and uh, enable electronic counting other than having paper receipts and, and counting them um, in full immediately after the election. So um, if, if you don't like the complex um, election because it's too much, the, the complex election system because it's too much work, then, well, the solution probably is to switch to an easier system, to, to a more simpler system. 
So at the moment there is no idea how to tack tackle this problem. So I couldn't hear that. So at the moment there is no idea how to make a workable system. Well, well paper ballots are a working system and yes, proven course, many, many times. Sorry, folks, could you please keep the noise level a little down? There are people that want to listen to the question and answer session. Thanks. Um, maybe you've already answered this question, but I um, didn't realize it. Um, what people are the ones that um, select these techniques for working on the outside? Well, well I guess the, if, if you refer to the cryptographic methods, um, I, th I think we haven't seen them anywhere in, in political elections. That, that is on the concept level now. If, you, if your question is referring to who selects e-voting products that are out there on the market, um, in Germany um, it's the municipalities which make the decision to purchase or, pu or not purchase electronic devices which are certified um, by the Ministry of, of Interior. Um, does that answer your question? Of course. Oh, sorry, it's me. Okay. Um, it, wouldn't a lot uh, of uh, those uh, methods like the punch cards and so on fail? Uh, just because, for example, in some regions you could, have, you could make coercion by choosing a specific region and just uh, pay people to vote at random. For example, always punch the first hole in a very conservative or liberal region. Yeah, I think that that's one of the attacks that have been uh, proposed against Punch Scania. Yeah. Um, do you have some comments on the current discussion with the Federal Constitutional Court about these issues? Is there anything of the cryptographic stuff mentioned during the uh, uh, in the open discussion? One of the authors um, was um, in the hearing as an um, expert, um, but he, he didn't make any comments on, um, on, on this proposed cryptographic methods. So um, the hearing was really about the real life need up um, issue. Um, can you tell me can you tell me anything about um, the motivation behind the research because it seems that it is a nice occupational therapy for researchers into the cryptography stuff but I do not see any advantage um, in contrast to the traditional voting methods as you said before um, well if, if I was in cryptography, which I'm not, um, I, I would probably think it's an interesting topic. And um, if, if people want to play around with it and want to fix this issue with secret input and secret processing, um, how can I make that auditable? auditable? Um, why not as, as long as they don't use it in real elections um, for the time being? Well, you, you now have demonstrated quite clearly that both uh, those electronic approaches do not work because they necessarily lack transparency. And on the other hand, you said that there is a, a real existing problem with voting uh, procedures so complex that they, uh, that they need an no inordinate amount of time to get, uh, to get counted. So are you aware of any methods uh, to count paper cast votes faster uh, in a more efficient way so that both uh, that uh, that uh, things uh, things get both done in in the correct way uh, without uh, without undue delay um, no I'm not um, I guess if you want an election system which involves um, heavy counting then you have to invest the time in counting it So that concludes the question and answer session. So thanks again to Ulrich.